No multiplayer this time. No multiplayer this time. Thank you. But improved single player experience. Hey, you don't need to. <laughs> but, uh, I controlled everything. Just a win, I didn't want it uh, alone. Hello. Well, uh, I'm in Berlin for reasons. Uh, I'm in a train station in Berlin and uh, if you see someone with a backpack behind me it's because they're a member of the games media. But where were we going? I could not honestly tell you. Well I've, I've got a pretty good idea where we're going. I'm pretty certain it's not Warsaw which is where, where this train's going. No, no, no I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Hello friends, I'm Colonel Failure, and in this video I'm taking you behind the scenes of the recent press event for Transport Fever 2. I got to speak to the development team and I was lucky enough to get my hands on with the game at the uh, pre-alpha stage uh, so I can reveal to you a few bits and pieces about what's coming up in this year's game. Uh, it won't be travelogue based stuff although I've got the interview that I did with Tom at the end and uh, in the first comment below you will find links to the individual sections that I talk about so if you just want to skip to the good stuff you certainly can do. Now we all know that gameplay is the most important thing, but the first thing you're struck by when playing Transport Fever 2 is just how pretty it looks. All the in-game shots that are in this video that you've not seen before were provided to me by the development team and it's using in-game alpha footage. Uh, and having played it for myself, yes, it does look this good. Uh, there are birds flying in the skies, there are critters running around the fields, the shadows have greater depth to them, the lighting is, is more pronounced. And all the textures have had fresh love paid to them uh, to really make the whole place come alive that little bit better. The budget that they've used to create Transport Fever 2 was three times that of the original game and it really does show they've taken on fresh art team members to give the engine a spruce up and, uh, and to eject some new life into it and frankly it's done a tremendous job. If high detailing or train spotting or cinematics are your thing then you really are going to be spoiled with the new game. It does look head and shoulders better than Transport Fever 1. And it's not just the landscape that has received special attention. Uh, the vehicles have as well. There is a significant amount more detail on individual models now. And the same goes for the little people who inhabit your world. Whereas previously there were maybe half a dozen different characters who would appear at each stage of your world's development. Now they are built on a modular system that allows many different variations of different costumes to appear. So instead of staring at that one bloke in his dungarees over and over again, now you'll be staring at various blokes in various different sets of dungarees, but they'll all be different colours. Disappointingly, or maybe hearteningly, uh, the uh, citizens no longer look aimlessly at the sky, waiting for the alien invasion to occur. Nope, now they look in a far more realistic fashion, and, uh, and I, for one, am going to miss Zeppelin Watch. While we've already had a very good development diary on the world editor, it's worth calling it out again because it is incredibly powerful. Rather than just randomly generating landscapes as it has done in the past, now you have the ability to actually lay that landscape out exactly as you want. You can craft the canyons, valleys, rivers, hills, mountains exactly as you like and then decorate them before heading into the game. If using real world landscapes as your thing, you can also import height maps directly into the world editor before adding the cities, towns and industries into the game world so that you're set up in exactly the way you want to be. The new biome on offer looks absolutely splendid and there's no limitations now with regard to which setting uses which biome. So if you want to use the desert biome within your European map, you're more than welcome to do so. Equally, if you wanted to play America as a tropical environment, then there's nothing to stop you from doing that either. In fact, you can mix and match biomes to your heart's content when setting up a new map. Where this gets really fun, and it wasn't enabled by default, but Tom was good enough to show me how to do it, is that by editing a config file, you can unlock the editor while the game itself is running. Effectively, you can drop cities into a game world without even pausing it. You can have vehicles running, and lo and behold, a brand new city appears. The same goes for industries, the same goes for rivers, mountains, trees, you name it. I tried this out for myself, because I saw it as an opportunity to try and crash the thing. 
I basically overlaid one city with six new ones in a fairly rapid fire fashion. And while it did take a minute or two for the game to kind of figure out what it was that I was trying to do, it managed to do it without any kind of slowdown or pause or anything like that. Now this was terrific because I saw it as the opportunity to create named distinct suburbs within one mega city. I ended up with 12 distinct towns placed within a very, very small area. How practical this will be in a gameplay sense, I'm not entirely sure, but I for one will certainly be trying it out. If you're looking for big hitting gameplay features for Transport Fever 2, well, the world editor is certainly one of them. And given how long we spend on an individual map, it shouldn't be downplayed just how important this is. One of the other features that we've seen mentioned in development diaries is modular stations. Now I got to play with modular stations and let me tell you, they are fantastic. Uh, the ability to build effectively your own bespoke solution to rail transport within a city uh, makes a big difference. Uh, I built what I'm pretty certain is the ugliest station in the history of the world. It had seven tracks on one side, uh, three of them had uh, multi-stops going on. Uh, I then created crossovers between different platforms. Uh, I put about 15 different station buildings around the outside. And of course it accepted freight right down the middle because why wouldn't you? It really is a very, very powerful solution to, uh, to getting stations exactly as you want them. Now, one thing that was pointed out to me is that underpasses for the station are very important. If you need to pass passenger traffic in between platforms, there is an invisible underground walkway that they use at present in order to get from side one to side two or platform three to platform seven. While you can't see your passengers making this journey, it does affect the amount of time it takes them to get from point A to point B. If you totally butcher a station design uh, with various different platforms pointing at every single different angle, uh, the game will work out for you a route between those platforms. However, it is also possible for you to place the entrances and exits to this underground network to ensure that your passengers keep moving smoothly. One feature of stations that hasn't been publicly talked about yet is the addition of dynamic elements. Now, I might be overblowing this a little bit, but station clocks will now show the exact time that it is on your system. A minor feature, perhaps, uh, but really quite nice. Equally, every station comes with its own signage, so it tells you what station it is you're pulling into. Now, this wasn't working in the build that I played, uh, but the signposts were definitely in place and they were all blank, which led me to believe this was a feature that was coming. I asked whether digital displays were a thing that could potentially turn up in the future, but only managed to get some kind of wiggly eyebrow shrug based response. And while that wasn't a no, it's not confirmed yet. So the final segment of information that you've probably already heard before is the new traffic management system that has been introduced to the game. Now, this is not on the level of the traffic president mod that you may be familiar with from City Skylines, but I think it possibly opens up the way for modders to do some really clever stuff with roads. In the first instance, what we're going to get is traffic lights and better priorities given to traffic within crowded areas of towns. On a more important basis, however, it does improve the intelligence of individual vehicles. The addition of road markings means that vehicles will line up to turn the correct way at junctions, and this should allow your traffic to flow more smoothly through city centres. So I got a chance to try this out to add traffic lights to a junction and to make sure that priorities were correctly set. I've also been able to set one-way streets in motion where previously they were operating in both directions, and it works pretty well. Exactly what the impact is going to be on traffic flow inside towns, we'll have to wait and see. I didn't get the opportunity to build a super city while playing the game. As you know, this takes many, many hours to accomplish. At first glance, it's a cool feature and one that was desperately needed. But exactly how far we can take it, I think we'll just have to wait and see. Enough of the stuff you already know about, let's get into the bits that are new. Now, one of Transport Fever's biggest areas of contention, I think, is probably the freight system that it uses. While it works just fine, it does take some getting used to and is possibly one of the biggest sticking points for players who are new to the game. The freight system in Transport Fever 2 has been overhauled. More than that, it's been overhauled in two significant areas. The first area that's been changed is in your production buildings. So this could be a farm, it could be a mine, it could be an oil well. In the previous game, these facilities 
facilities would increase their production the more you used them, and that required ensuring that demand was high throughout the whole of the route. As you build up a backlog in a different area on the route, production would fluctuate, and this led to freight facilities occasionally becoming a somewhat unreliable source of income. Personally, I've spent many hours playing whack-a-mole with my freight routes to try and figure out where backlogs are occurring and where it is that I can streamline things in order to make sure that my production remains high. Well, that's a thing of the past. In Transport Fever 2, every production facility has its production rate locked. The numeric value it's locked to is 200. And my instinct says that this is the same kind of 200 level of production that you would experience in Transport Fever 1. It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down. It will always produce 200. This means that you're likely to need multiple sources of raw materials and feed those into one of the larger manufacturing facilities. These manufacturing facilities work in more or less the same way as they do now. So whereas before you would work one farm into one food processing plant, in Transport Fever 2 you will probably work multiple farms into that same processing plant, before then shipping the completed products out to various cities. From what I saw, and I didn't get a chance to experiment for more than around half an hour using this particular area of the game, this actually makes quite a big difference. Where previously it would be a one-to-one -one ratio between the uh, raw resource and then the manufacturing facility, now you'll be pulling from multiple raw resource sources and routing those into one factory. This will lead to more and lengthier routes in order to get the right level of production to service your network. It's also probably a little bit more realistic, but your mileage on that may vary. This leads, however, to the second big change to the freight system. In Transport Fever 2, not every city accepts every type of product. Now, every city will accept two products only, usually one commercial and one industrial goods type. Obviously, using the map editor, you can decide which cities use which, if you want to. But it does mean that things like the EPEC challenge that was made popular by Skystorm is a thing of the past, as individual cities will now only ever require two different types of goods. I'm on the fence about this change, partly because huge freight trains were one of my favourite things to build in Transport Fever, and frequently one of the best ways to get started was to deliver a product like food to as many different cities as you could. This would often lead to a situation where you had plenty of profit coming in with which to expand. That approach will no longer work, because if not every city demands food as one of its two core products, well, that's not going to do you any favours. Whether or not it's a logical change, I think, is entirely up to you to decide. On the plus side, however, it means that there is no route one to success. You're now going to need to work a little harder in order to provide the right freight to the right cities. And that's assuming, of course, you can get the right raw materials into production in the first place. The big upside is that once you have this nailed, your income should be significantly more reliable from freight, and much less prone to fluctuations that we've seen in Transport Fever 1. Based on the way it's set up in the game right now, however, I don't think it will be too long before we see the multi-cargo mod arriving on the scene, uh, or the multi-demand mod let's say. I think it's highly likely that we'll see someone introduce something that will allow every city to accept every type of commodity once again. Although that's purely instinct on my part. Overall, I think these freight changes are really interesting. I think they're going to add a fresh dynamic to the way that we use freight in Transport Fever, and I think it removes some of the easy route methods that we have used in the past in order to make early profit. I also think it will mean that we end up having to supply more materials to different places in order to build a comprehensive cargo network. Whether or not this makes for better gameplay, again, I don't know yet. I'm going to have to spend more time with it to find out. And regrettably, I no longer have the ability to play with it. Essentially, what this system does is it makes your income from freight far less volatile, but also far more challenging for veteran players to just make work immediately. In every fresh game of Transport Fever, the one thing that you would always try and do is fill the map as much as you possibly could, or at the very least make as much use of the landscape that you had available to you. In the couple of years since it's released, we've also seen map sizes increase dramatically as it became possible to remove the limits in the config scripts. In fact, if you were to ask most Transport Fever players what map size they'd like, they'd say infinite. 
Well, infinite maps aren't coming our way. Uh, I don't think that technology exists just yet. And much like the previous game, we are going to be limited in terms of the size of maps that can be made. The good news on that front is they're not any smaller than the ones you could make in Transport Fever. And I strongly suspect that within no time at all, we'll be able to unlock them to be whatever size we want. As always, however, with greater size, there is a bigger payoff when it comes to performance. Late game performance is something that the dev team are hoping to address but there's always going to be a hard cap at some point on what a processor and graphics card combination can handle. So much like with the existing game, the frame rate you see in the year 2300 is going to differ to the frame rate that somebody else sees. All I do know is that there is an effort to try and make late game run a little better. However, that has not been the primary focus for development. In this sense, look for improvement, not a radical overhaul. Game overlays have been significantly enhanced for the new game, so when highlighting different routes going into a station or the different zones within a city, this will now highlight over the top of a white box outline of your game in progress. You can probably see that in the video segment shown now. This helps in making it much easier to see where you're going and what you're looking at. More importantly, however, is the brand new overlay, Pollution. In isolation, this might not sound like too much fun, However, in reality, it is a major change to the way you're going to need to think about gameplay. If you run a highly polluting route, pollution in this case could be sound, but more likely it's going to be smog or smoke or other pollutants that you would usually associate with mass transit. Running a heavy polluting line through the center of a city is going to have a strong adverse effect on land value. As a result, you may inadvertently drive population centers away from your network hubs. So rather than just smashing a line straight into the middle of town, as you would likely do in the past, now you're going to want to give it a little bit more thought. Airports also behave in the same way, in that they're going to create a significant amount of sound and air pollution. One of the new tools you have with airports, however, is that you can actually change the direction of flight. So if you want planes flying over the city before landing, you can do that if you wish, as you now have control over the approach and departure vectors. Again, this is one we're going to have to suck and see to see how it pans out. The new style of overlays is certainly a welcome addition, and it does make it much easier to see what's going on and where. The effects of pollution, however, could be game-changing and will make you think a little harder as you plan your new route. From what I've seen, pollution doesn't seem to be a deal-breaker. It is still very possible to have a busy, smoky old station right in the centre of town and still generate passengers from it. Later in the game, however, I suspect that the most profitable routes are going to be the ones that don't disturb the local population. Okay, this section should be relatively quick. There's a new campaign, everybody, uh, and apparently it's good. It apparently it's really good. Very, very good, apparently, probably. Um, I, I never played the campaign in Transport Fever, so I wouldn't know what to compare it against. Also, I, I didn't play the campaign in Transport Fever 2 when I had the opportunity to do so, so I really couldn't tell you what to expect. What I do know, however, is that it is more structured than previously, and that Tom, who is a delight, is very, very proud of it. So I've covered off quite a few things that are in the game. Fundamentally, what I have seen, it does look pretty good, but I do need to address the elephants in the room, and that are the things that are not intended to be in this game. It's probably a tie between AI opponents and multiplayer as the big item that everybody's hoping will appear. Well, the bad news is neither of those are going to turn up in Transport Fever this time around. Having spoken both to Tom and to Basil, the head of the studio, both areas of gameplay are desirable for inclusion in the future, probably in a Transport Fever 3, or possibly 4, or possibly 5. Certainly, the studio has no intention of giving up on the series in the near future. One of the main reasons the studio was founded was to create a modern equivalent to Transport Tycoon, which had, as you're aware, AI opponents and multiplayer. I had a good length chat with Basil and it gave me some real insight into the way that he's thinking about the game, or rather the game series. And with Transport Fever 2, what they're aiming to do is improve on the imperfections of the original. They're trying to get rid of some of the things that turn people off from the game, while at the same time give it plenty of scope for enhancement and hopefully to stick around for a long time. For the first time in their history, Urban Games will actually be releasing paid DLC for Transport Fever 2. I've absolutely no details with regards to what might be in these items, but given the strength of the modding community, I would imagine these will be big, meaty bits of functionality. I very much doubt that either multiplayer or AI opponents will be those pieces of functionality, as those are, well, they really need to be in the game from the ground up. If you're going to add a feature like multiplayer, the first thing you need to understand is, well, what is multiplayer? Is it cooperative? Is it collaborative? Should you have the option to do both? 
Can player one interfere with player two's construction? Are they competing for the same pool of passengers? If so, is it possible to knock someone out of the game? How long should a game last? How many players should a game support? Perhaps they decide to go with asynchronous multiplayer, which is my own personal preference, where individual players who are involved are entirely isolated and only connected through their transport networks. Essentially, before urban games start looking at a feature like this or like AI opponents, they really need to understand what is the need they're trying to fulfill. Because first and foremost, it needs to be fun. If Transport Fever has proved anything, it is that there is a dedicated audience to this game, and that they're not going anywhere. So rather than immediately leaping into a big, bold, flashy new feature, they want to perfect what they've got already. The team from TransportFever.net were present on the train as well for this press event, and while I focused on gameplay, they spent their entire time focusing on modding and mod making and what the new game would offer them. As such, if you head over to TransportFever.net, I'm pretty certain that they will have considerably more details with regards to what to expect from the new game. What I do know, however, is that existing models, if you've made a new train or a locomotive or a truck for the game, should port over reasonably easily. However, higher levels of detail are now possible. So you may just want to upscale things a little before doing so. From a player perspective, of course, what this means is you shouldn't have to wait too long before you've got a good variety of additions you can make to your game. The studio philosophy at Urban Games is that these transport type titles are what they make. They're not about to go and make a first person shooter or a fantasy RPG. Basil most certainly is singularly focused on making a great transport game. And with each iteration of Transport Fever, they hope to get a bit closer to that goal. I certainly enjoyed what I saw when I got the opportunity to play the game, to the extent that while being offered additional time to play later in the day, I turned them down because I don't want to play any more now until I can play it properly. I spent around three hours with the title in total, and I got a really good feel for how it's evolving the game. It certainly runs more smoothly, it certainly looks more attractive, and the new features, while they might not sound like headline grabbers, add a great deal to those who are already experienced with it. The addition of pollution and the changes to the freight system make for some really interesting gameplay choices, while the map editor means that we've got an awful lot of variety we can now accomplish when it comes to map making. Obviously, when I interviewed Tom, and you can see the interview shortly after this, I asked when's the game coming out, and all I was told was Q4. I thought with my special relationship with the studio they might tell me what the release date was, but they didn't. So I can't tell you what it is either. Q4. That's, that's all they're saying. Anyway, what follows is a fairly noisy interview between me and Tom from Urban Games. If you can make it out, I'm sure you will glean a few more nuggets of information from it. If you decide you already have all the nuggets you need for one day, well, thank you very much for watching. Go on, who are you? Hi, I'm Tom from Urban Games. Very good. <laughs> uh, we're familiar with that line. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what's this event that we've got going on here? It's a first hands-on, so where everybody can uh, play our new game Transport Fever 2 for the first time. And with everybody, I mean, uh, of course, selected range of people, including a couple of uh, press and uh, YouTubers. That's cool. Uh, so, how long has Transport Fever 2 been in development? Uh, we basically started to, to shift development, I think, about a year, year and a half after the last game was released so it was a gradual process not from one day to the other but yeah let's say uh, around two to three years About two to three years okay well that's good so how close are you now to creating the ultimate transport for you? because you're never going to get it all into one game. Yeah. Uh, the first game was a great evolution over Train Fever. Yeah. This is an exciting piece of train, isn't it? <laughs> um, and, uh, and having played it, the new one is as good an evolution again uh, yeah. as, the, as the first one was. So how much further can you take it? I think much further. There's always room to improve. There are always new ideas. The main question is, uh, what do players want? So we get tons of ideas which we could technically include in the game, but not everything is for everybody. And so the question remains, what is the ultimate game? Is it, has it all the features? Has it only the features for, let's say, new players, only for core players? Uh, of course, we have to address all of them. So we cannot put everything in the game, but I would say there is still room to improve even after Transport Fever 2. Excellent. Well, some of the features we know that aren't in Transport <laughs> Fever 2, 
uh, I asked the good people of Reddit for their questions, and they asked. What, and pretty much what you already know is coming. So, yeah. uh, so things like multiplayer. Yeah. Uh, we know already that you'd really like to include multiplayer. Yeah, yeah. But give us an idea of just how much work that is. Uh, there are multiple parts to it because first of all, you have to to um, you have a technical limitation to overcome. You have to do the, the net code, take care of that the multiplayer itself. Work so that is a huge part of the work which could take months, a year or two, uh, depending. And then there is the game design aspect. So you have to design the game for multiplayer. So what would multiplayer actually be for? How would how would that turn out? Would it, uh, is it competitive? Are you building together? That's exactly is, the question. Are you separated into different areas? That's exactly the questions I'm talking about. So they have to be answered first, and then you have to implement it, and then you have to make something fun. And I would say most of the time, at least I hear about uh, co-op, that people would like a co-op mode, which of course uh, that would be possible from a design standpoint in the current game, we just share the work, but is that the fun part? That has to be figured out. And the other thing, as we said, competitive mode. If you think about games like uh, Transport Tycoon, of course they have multiplayer, they have competitive mode, but at points it's only, or sometimes it's only getting in the way of each other. And that's also maybe not fun for everybody. So yeah, difficult question, which we yet have to answer. Okay, so let's just be clear. No multiplayer this time. No multiplayer this time. Thank you. But improved single player experience. Hey, you don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> I controlled everything. That's the reason why I didn't want it uh, alone. <laughs> I hope that's on camera. It's on camera, <laughs> complete with the screaming in the background. <laughs> I saved a beer. Yeah, that yeah. Is, uh, that's all good. <laughs> right, picking up where we left off. Yeah, uh, let's get my angle back on here. Uh, marvelous. So the other big one that's requested, of course, yeah. is uh, is AI opponents. Now, here's the thing, and this was an argument that I hadn't seen made before, and I yeah. read it in the in the question thread today. Was that actually in the real world there aren't any AI opponents? You have been given exclusive rights to run your train along a particular line. At least in the modern version. In yes. the modern version, yeah. yeah. I mean, when back in the rail baron days, then, you know, that's very different. Yeah. Um, AI opponents. Not this time? Not this time. Okay, I mean, is it something that is on your wish list, or is it, or is it yeah. less the game that you're trying to make? Yeah, it's kind uh, of down the same uh, alley like, like multiplayer, because it has a lot of the same... Uh, same technical uh, aspects which you have to solve in any case so if, if a second player is an AI player or a human player it's technically about the same so uh, my guess is and it's only a guess of course if we do multiplayer at one time that comes with AI kind of in the same package so yeah if we do AI then probably multiplayer too but as I said not in this game and future plans not yet made so, I mean, my intention is not just to ask you questions where you have to say no. That's great. Okay, <laughs> there will be some where you say yes. <laughs> Things like day-night cycle, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we spoke about that a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, day-night cycle, speak to me of day-night cycle. Yeah. Kind of the same answer like with multiplayer. So, first of all, you have to implement it technically and then you have to make uh, interesting gameplay out of it and as I think everybody knows the pacing of transport fever with you know, days flying by yeah, does not serve the AI cycle well and yeah, maybe other games have it but not all use it as a gameplay and we always or at least it's for transport fever 2 we tried to make uh, when we implement big features which take a lot of time that they not only serve a visual purpose but also a gameplay purpose and uh, uh, at least for the moment uh, day night cycle is not one of them so was something we, we have to skip but at least we try to improve on uh, yeah how you can change the mood of the game so you can change the lightning you can change the, the skybox um, and I would say at least that for a lot of people is, is the main purpose of a day and night cycle. They just want to have a different mood. Yeah. And that, to some extent, is already possible. That, uh, that completely. And because this is going to look good in a tunnel. Uh, so, 
one of the things you showed off this morning, yeah. uh, which I really liked, was the uh, the new texturing tool, so yeah. the, the landscape texturing tool. So it, uh, it looked to me like you've probably got 32 maybe different ground textures in yeah. the game now. Yeah. Uh, what's the hard limit on that? Uh, 256 from what I know at the moment. And presumably modders can put their own packs yes, together. Yes, yes, yes. Because that allows you to completely change the look and feel of the, sure, of the landscape yeah. overall. And I, I mean, I'm going to talk about this separately, but uh, how much do you like the new editing system, the new editor? I like it a lot because, again, I am responsible for the campaign and making the campaign maps last time was rather challenging. And this time with all the tools, uh, yeah, we have a lot more freedom and can design really nice maps for the campaign. So I like it a lot. So um, is there a means whereby I can export my, uh, my map setup to the workshop nice and easily? Because I can see the, the editor being used very strongly as like a, yeah, a scenario yeah. or a challenge builder yeah. uh, that other players will want to use. Sure, I think at the moment it's only a question about file size. Yeah. Can we get it down so that it's feasible for a workshop upload? You don't want like 500 megabytes no, for a map, of course. Yeah. Uh, and with the new Terrain system, everything is rather compressed, so it's, uh, uh, file sizes went down already. But of course, the more you change, and with changing landscape, the resolution, gets a bit higher and you have a little bit more of, of file space so I think it's up to that if we can fit it in a small enough file but technically of course possible. Now I mean, the one thing that you notice straight away as a veteran kind of transport theme yeah. player is just how good it looks. Yeah. Um, it's like a thousand small changes to how, to how it looks and the whole thing is just more uh, it's crisper. Yeah. Uh, what sort of process went into kind of overhauling the engine to, to polish it up again? Uh, a graduate process over the years, so uh, it's not like we, we just switched one day to another engine. It's like adding one thing after another and I think a lot of uh, the visual improvements are also due to our, no, our new stuff. So we uh, hired a couple of new people which are really experts in their field, so also with a background in uh, movie producing and which have really a good eye for things. So somebody might say programmers don't have that eye for pretty things. I don't know. I didn't check. I didn't exactly. say that. And, yeah, I didn't check, but uh, our artists have a really great vision. Let's put it that way. I would say the artists had a great vision about how it should look and the programmers uh, made it happen. So yeah, it's really something they said there was a plan in the beginning and we worked towards it. The little AI people I notice are no longer looking for aliens. Yeah. Uh, have the aliens arrived and if so were they friendly? Uh, most of them were. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, I mean, the, in all seriousness, the new character models are really good. Uh, and. It looks like you're using kind of a component system on the individual characters yeah, exactly. now. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it, it makes for much more variety than having 20 guys in dungarees or stuff. Yeah. New freight! It's good, isn't it? <laughs> the new freight system, you mean? or uh, the, uh, the, the fact that freight is now limited to two items uh, of yeah, goods yeah. per, yeah, per yeah, town. Yeah, yeah. Um, who, how, why and when did you brainstorm this as an idea? Because it's not something that is immediately obvious yeah. uh, of actually creating more gameplay yeah. by taking actually some choices away. Yeah, yeah. so we defined a couple of, uh, let's say, core pillars before we started designing the game. And one of them was to make the player more follow the world, not the other way around. I think in Transport Fever, one, so to speak, uh, everything what you have done kind of worked. So the, the world changed around what you did. And that was one of the main yeah, things we figured that we have to flip around these things to, to make it a bit more challenging for people. And uh, as you said, taking away choices in the end means you have to think about more where you put lines. You cannot just take a farm 
or take take a, a, a any factory and just connect it to any town. It right. doesn't work anymore. So you have to think about it. You have to strategize. And so the idea was pretty early that the system has to change. That is now down to two. Was also mm, yeah gradual process of a bit of testing. At some point there were four, or yeah even <laughs> other <laughs> variations. Right. But that one after testing turned out to be. Um, uh, the best balance the, the sweet spot right? yeah so i mean the other thing on uh, on changing the way you play is the new emission system yeah now on the surface you know pollution doesn't sound like it's a game changer yeah uh, but from experimenting this morning uh, it was quite obvious that cities would not grow fast yeah, yeah. if you did have pollution running straight yeah, through yeah. a residential zone so how do you how do you choose a feature that impacts gameplay Without being something that is going to take you years to to change uh, to implement, and then that uh, that doesn't radically change the underlying game. Is there a methodology that you use to, to kind of pull ideas together? How do you how do you wish list the uh, the items that you're going to pull into a new game? Uh, yeah, multi stage process, I would say. Uh, first of all, everybody in the office uh, comes with his own ideas. We regularly sit together, discuss, look what people, uh, um, about what people have the same opinion, and uh, yeah, then make a design plan for that uh, feature, and then implement the first version. And usually, it doesn't take too long that you, especially if you have a bit of experience, figure out quite early if it goes in the right direction or not. So if it from the beginning feels like uh, either complicated or meaningless, then yeah, you may better scrap it right now and, and do something completely different. But with emissions, it was that we wanted to give like the different, one, one, one approach was the different types of vehicles, like we have steam locomotives, we have diesel locomotives, and uh, of course, obviously uh, the electric engines all with different emissions and that was one additional aspect we said yeah we don't use that now that maybe steam locomotives make a lot of dirt or, or old buses are very loud could could you also use that okay and for example that was one of the things and the other one was that coming back to the to the point before uh, having the player adapt to the world cities when they complain about noise you have to do something so and that was the second thing where i said yeah, cities should have uh, desires or, or needs so like the different cargo types but also for public and for private transport and in the end also for yeah, not being too noisy or too polluted so as you develop more of the game and i don't know how much of this is going to be usable because it's really loud in here uh, as you as you develop the game further uh, I mean the addition of uh, traffic lights yeah. and the, the road changing tools and the overlays that go with it well, you're getting very close to city skylines here so how, where do you draw the line between a, a sim city city skylines and transport fee yeah. what's the difference I think maybe kind of the same answer I gave already two times it's you as a player have to adapt to the world skylines obviously uh, is more like a sandbox you design the city, you decide where the buildings are, you decide that the city grows, um, you are in control of everything uh, and at the same time all the public transport is maybe not that fleshed out and for us it's the aspect of the public transport industry, uh, cargo systems, passengers and you serving the cities which then grow themselves. It's a good answer. <laughs> well done. Good one. Yeah, that's sad. So we want you practice that. No, it didn't. You just came <laughs> up with that. But I suspect you'll be using it again. Um, all right, good. All right, uh, okay, your top three items that people should look for in Transport Fever 2. Best, oh. be top three best bits. Ooh, that's difficult. Obviously, I have to say campaign. That's because you made it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is this okay? That's allowed. That's allowed. Then. But it's your top three, not mine. <laughs> yeah. I think all the, the word editing tools, because that's really something we wanted to do for, for the people who want to make nice and things. And it makes it easier to make campaigns with. You're on a, you're a single track <laughs> move 
here. Yes, all right, you've got one more. One more. Uh, maybe a small one. Okay. But I really love that you can now uh, stop time. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, meant, I meant to mention that. Yeah. Explain to people, because this is cool, and it's yeah. something that's been on my wish list that I just haven't mentioned. Yeah. Uh, explain the stop time tool. Very easy, you can just stop time, which means you play on the same day or in the same year all the time, but the simulation is still running. So you can play in the same age basically forever. So you continue to, I mean, your trains and your, your vehicles continue to age. Yeah. So you still have to pay the running costs on yeah, them. Exactly. But it can be 1975 yeah. forever. Yeah. Great. That's spot on. All big boys all the time. That's that's what I'm going to be about, and no one will be able to say, oh, should you be upgrading some electric rubbish by now? I go, no, all big boy, all day. It's still 1962. Quiet. Marvellous. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, when's it coming out? Quarter four, 2019. No, 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 that's no good. Because yeah. quarter four, I mean, you're talking October, November, December. Exactly. Right? Well, uh, last time around, it was the 26th of November. Yeah. Uh, this time around, are we going before or after the 26th of November? Answer the question, confirm or deny. I will answer it as soon as I have the fixed date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not playing the game, are you? That's, uh, no, get out of my sight. Thank you, Tom. You've been delightful, as always. <laughs> Try to. <laughs> Thanks, man. Brilliant. Sure. Well, there you go. That was that was my adventure in Berlin. I'm sorry, there isn't a little bit more uh, brand new footage for you to see, but uh, we were restricted, so we weren't allowed to record any footage at all of the game. Uh, one of the big pieces that they're working on is an overhaul of the UI, and it's not quite in yet. So there's kind of it's a bit patchy at the moment. It's like a blue version of the existing UI at the moment, and it's and it's not done yet. Um, so that's why they didn't want us to capture. But to be honest. It played really well. It's very solid, very smooth, uh, definitely very pretty. Uh, didn't really see any placeholder stuff going on in there. And frankly, I'm now itching to play more of it. Uh, is it going to change the mind of those of you who don't like Train Fever at the moment? Probably not. Uh, is it going to inspire those of you who like Train Fever now to play, buy the new one? Yes, it will. And you won't look back. Uh, in the same way as once you've got transport fever, you don't buy, you don't play train fever anymore. Did I say train fever a minute ago? You know what I mean. Uh, yeah, once you've got transport fever, you don't play train fever. Well, this is going to be the same again. Once you've got transport fever too, you won't want to play uh, transport fever anymore. Anyway, I'll release more information as I get it. But that's you've got everything that I had in my head. Now, that's you and I are on pretty much the same page. Uh, if you've got more questions that I haven't covered here, please sling it in the comments. And I want to give a quick shout out to the boys and girls at, uh, at Urban Games and Good Shepherd Entertainment uh, for inviting me along in the first place. I had a very, very nice time. Um, yeah, just riding on a train from the 70s. Uh, talking to some developers, hanging out with other community people and playing a bit of Transport Fever too. Doesn't sound so bad, does it? No, no. I'd, I'd do it again, just in case you're asking.